Happy Sabbath, saints. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? It's such a joy to be here on God's holy Sabbath day to worship with like-minded believers. And we want to just give him all the glory, right? I want to thank those of you who are joining us online. I just want to say a special greeting to my family who's watching, and uh, I miss you all terribly. But praise the Lord for technology, and we can commune with one another over long distances. It should make the work of spreading the gospel a whole lot easier, shouldn't it? And during our Sabbath school class, we kind of talked about what would happen if each of us was responsible for bringing one soul to Christ per year. One soul per Christ to, to Christ per year. Think about that. That would be exponential growth. We would double every single year. In fact, uh, I have a, a personal friend, a very, very famous Seventh-day Adventist minister, who said if he was in charge, he would change the criteria of what constitutes being a member in good standing in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and that would be one of the requirements. But uh, I'm not mentioning his name, obviously, because he'd probably get in trouble for saying that. Um, but we have a high calling, don't we? And we're going to talk about how we're getting distracted from our high calling today. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, I kneel before you because I am unworthy. I recognize that it's only because of the grace of Christ and his sufficiency that I am here. Father, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Lord, I cry out to you, asking that you cover me and allow the truth, Jesus Christ, to be revealed. Use me as merely an instrument for your purpose. And I just want to dedicate this time to you and to give you all the glory with this worship. Please accept us because we're doing this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. If you saw this sign, warning, minefield, would you just ignore it and just keep walking forward? But routinely, we ignore signs, yes? Especially this one. Let's be honest. How many of us ignore the speed limit sign on a regular basis? Okay. <laughs> the camera's not showing you, so you may freely raise your hand. It's only showing me right now. But there are some consequences for ignoring signs, isn't there? Right? Remember this? Now, how many of you have been pulled over because of your speeding? Oh, yeah. I have a confession to make. I actually got a letter from the Oregon DMV when I was in college saying... You have more speeding tickets than the average Oregonian driver. Yeah, one of those letters. <laughs> um, that was because I used to live in Eugene, going to the University of Oregon, and every week I would come up to the Korean Seventh-day Adventist Church because I was the choir director. And so every Friday after school, I'd drive all the way up there, and then after Sabbath, I'd drive all the way back. So I was on the road quite a bit. Um, and I like to drive fast. Well, about 25 years ago, this was after college, uh, my, my family and some friends were at the Oregon coast. Now, I will freely admit, I don't know whether I saw a sign like this or not, but even if there was a sign, I know better, you know? I know better than what this sign is trying to tell me, and I chose to ignore it. So we walked closer to the ocean, and we got to the edge of the cliffs, and we were enjoying the view, 
and our friends continued wandering to the right of us alongside the edge of the cliff when suddenly waves started crashing on the rocks next to us and one of our friends got so shocked and then lost the balance and fell over the cliff. Whew. My father and I ran along that cliff face. I was crawling over rocks, and we rushed to get to her. And while you're doing this, what does your mind do? Your th- mind just simply goes, Dear Jesus, help us, help us. Dear God, help us. That's all it's doing. And we're like, oh, because we couldn't see her. The waves came, crashed, she lost her balance, fell forward, and went straight down. We got there, and we found her sprawled out on another ledge, 15 feet lower. Long story short, she refused the helicopter ride that was called because she said she couldn't afford it, and she actually survived with just bruises and cuts. And today, she still carries a scar on her face that shows this. And she still says, we saved her life. I, but we only did what anyone else would probably do. But folks, think about it, church family. Should we have ignored the sign? Yes. No. Signs need to be taken seriously. They're there for a reason. And the Bible is full of signs we should not be ignoring There is a stunning passage in the book of Matthew where Jesus was giving us many signs. He describes the signs preceding his second coming. And we have parallel counts in both the other synoptic gospels of Mark and Luke. And Matthew's account here is actually the most complete. More than likely, it was late Tuesday afternoon, and Jesus had spent time in the temple all day teaching in the temple courts, and was attacked repeatedly by group after group after group of Jewish leaders. Finally, in his final public discourse, which you'll find in Matthew 23, Jesus described in unmistakable terms the hypocritical character of these blind guides, He says in verse 16. He even calls them serpents and broods of vipers in verse 33. And then Jesus left the temple forever. That was his last visit. Jesus left the temple and walked down into the Kidron Valley and then climbed up the Mount of Olives, which was about 300 feet higher than the temple. And here we're looking from David's palace over the Kidron Valley at the Mount of Olives under the appropriately green arrow. And you'll see the southeast corner of the Temple Mount under the white arrow. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. You know, much to their absolute astonishment, Jesus told his disciples that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. But more than that, Jesus said the temple would be dismantled stone by stone. Wait a minute. The temple? That was a symbol of national greatness. There is no way in the world this temple would be destroyed. Are you serious, Jesus? Well, this actually troubled the disciples. They didn't understand what was going on. And so when they finally got to the Mount of Olives, when he sat down, the disciples came to him privately, privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your soon coming? and of the age of the day. So Mark chapter 13, the parallel account, in verse 3 tells us there were at least four disciples because he names Peter, Andrew, James, and John. 
who came to Jesus privately. Why did the disciples come to Jesus privately? Well, I would like to submit that most issues, if you have a lack of understanding, works best if you try to approach the people privately. Okay? But maybe they were concerned and the symbol of their national uh, pride being dismantled just disheartened them. Maybe they were anticipating Jesus to declare himself king and, and talking about Jesus becoming king was, you know, if you talked about that publicly, that'd be considered treasonous. Whatever the case, the disciples had the benefit of having a divine commentator explaining the words of Jesus. They had direct access to Jesus Christ. Friends, I want to remind you that you also have a divine commentator who can explain the words of Jesus, and that commentator is none other than the Holy Spirit. So we have every advantage that the disciples had, except for the fact that they were able to interact with Jesus face to face, but we'll soon be able to do that. So they came to Jesus privately and asked, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of age? And Jesus' answer is remarkable here because he explains signs at the same time to his disciples who were living with him then and then to his disciples who were going to be living at the end of times. And Jesus explains these signs simultaneously that pointed to the destruction of Jerusalem and also the signs that were going to happen at the end of the world. Well, what were some of these signs? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am Christ and will deceive many. Notice the first topic out of Jesus' mouth is about deception. We live in a day and age where the truth of God is being exchanged for lies. Romans 1.25 Granted, the context here is primarily dealing with false Christs. No doubt about that. But think about it. Our politicians and leaders lie to us. Our media lies to us. Our teachers lie to us. Lies are repeated so often that these lies then become truth. This is the climate that we live in today. Notice the word many. This is Jesus indicating that deception, especially spiritual deception, will happen frequently, frequently. Friends, we need to immerse ourselves in the truth of God's word. The Bible is the final arbiter of truth because in them you search the scriptures for you think you're finding eternal life, but they are these that testify of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said he was the truth the way, and the life. So read your Bibles and pray every day because that will safeguard against you from deception. Jesus continued, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. <laughs> are there world nations and kingdoms at each other's throats? Oh yeah, absolutely. Of course, I know that you know all about the Ukraine-Russian war. After all, we've been selling Ukraine billions of dollars, right? But just last Sabbath, we became aware of the atrocities that are happening in the Middle East, even right now. And we know about these wars because they're fresh on the news cycle and they're uh, talked about incessantly in social media. But you know what? No one talks about Myanmar's civil war anymore. And the most recent coup d'etat started nearly two and a half years ago. In fact, in Ethiopia, civil war is rampant. And the Oromo conflict has been going on for 50 years now. Ethiopia and the Oromo Liberation Army actually started talks for peace this April, late April. And they started fighting again in the middle of May. And this map here shows the conflicts that only happened just in September. And some of you have been directly affected by this, have relatives over there. Besides the ones we mentioned right now, there are wars in Colombia, Afghanistan, DR Congo, Uganda, Sudan, Somalia, Nigeria, Yemen, Syria, Iraq. And when I say war, 
What I mean is these are all places that have had 1,000 combat-related deaths or more within the last year. That's a lot. People are dying everywhere, and most of us just carry on. Jesus said you will hear wars and rumors of wars. He also said that there would be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. According to the United Nations World Food Program, more than 345 million people in 79 countries are facing acute levels of food insecurities. That's the new word for famine uh, because they want to expand the definition a little bit. But these people don't know where their next meal is coming from. 345 million people, 79 countries. This is actually more than double than the number that was in 2020. And sadly, a lot of this famine is man-made. Well, let's not talk too much about pestilences. We just all went through COVID, but I will say two things. Uh, a recent 700,000 person study from Israel showed that the double vaccinated were 27 times more likely to get reinfected with COVID. And data from England, Scotland, and Northern Europe showed that people who are triple vaccinated were more likely to die. Also, a Cochrane review says, and I quote, wearing masks in the community probably makes little or no difference to the outcome of laboratory confirmed influenza or SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19, compared to not wearing masks. Now, if you don't know about the Cochrane Review, go home and Google it. This is an established uh, systematic review sort of organization where they look at multiple, multiple research and they collate all of that together. Well, regardless of your opinions on all of this and whatever research you want to subscribe to, there is still very, very strong evidence that masks and lockdowns have neg negatively impacted young children and their development. There is no doubt about that. Well, what about earthquakes? Did you know seven days ago when war broke out in the Middle East, there was a 6.3 magnitude earthquake in Afghanistan that killed more than 1,000 people. And just three days ago, another 6.3 was recorded about 17 miles outside of Herat, the country's, uh, Afghanistan's third largest city, and it started from six miles deep. Right now, we don't know how many died from that, but there have been hundreds that have gone to the hospital because of this. But do you remember this past February? In Turkey, Syria, there were two earthquakes there. Both of them hit with 7.8 and a 7.5 on the Richter scale. There were over 59,000 people who perished because of these earthquakes. And then Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. sorrows. You know, the Greek word there translated into the English sorrows literally means birth pains, birth pains. And mothers... When you're having your baby, what happens to those con contractions right before the baby comes out? They increase in intensity and frequency. So what Jesus is saying is all of these are the beginning of the birth pains of this world, this earth, and all of these sorts of things will happen and increase with frequency and intensity. And then later on in this sermon, Jesus said, and because lawlessness, lawlessness, or iniquity in the original King James, will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Has iniquity become more prevalent in the world within the last year, within the last five years? Oh, absolutely. Last week we had Dr. Conrad Vine and Pastor Numa share stories from the frontier mission field. Remember what Frontier Mission was? A place where no one has heard the name of Jesus or even know what a Bible is, right? And they privately told me stories of actual spirit possession and how prevalent it is overseas, particularly in foreign missions, and how the devil will just take over people. They, he goes about like a 
a hungry lion devouring people, and he causes them to speak with strange voices and demonstrate superhuman strength. And sometimes they just call on the spirits and they make a game out of it. And they say, okay, let's see how many people it takes to hold this person down. And the person will call on the spirits and then a whole bunch of people will start jumping on him and they count. And then they bet on it. This is their pastime. He also talked about how shaman priests actually change shapes into animals or even birds and actually fly away. I mean, sounds like science fiction movies, right? Or superhero movies. No, you guys, those are all based on reality. In fact, deliverance ministry, as our church calls it, or exorcism, as the Catholic church calls it, this is a part of training for many that go into these frontier missions because this is so prevalent. But, friends, Satan is not only at work overseas. Right here in America, Dr. Vine, he told me there was a report of how police chased a young man into a room, thought he had him cornered, and the guy turned around, walked up the wall, walked across the ceiling, dropped down behind the cops and ran out the room. In America, this was happening. And then he said to me, Dr. Vine, he told me, if you have the stomach for it, look up SRA. Folks, my eyes were open to how much of a bubble we're really living in. We are living in a tiny little bubble, and we have no idea how rampant the satanic forces are at play here in America. We, and we have this danger just right outside our doors, and we don't recognize how much God is protecting us. And yet we sit here and argue about what color paint we're going to use in the hallway. Folks, we need to wake up to the times that we're living in. You know, it is very evident that iniquity has become more prevalent in the world, correct? But what really saddens me is how much it has crept into our church. Here's an event that is scheduled to take place this November at La Sierra University. How many are familiar with La Sierra University? Yeah, it's one of our Seventh-day Adventist institutions. Well, at La Sierra University and at their church, they are hosting this event. And if you go to the Kinship website, it answers the question, what does the Bible say about LGBTQIA plus people? And the answer reads, quote, we believe the Bible does not condemn same gender orientation, nor does it address transgender identity. Many Seventh-day Adventist Christians, from lay people to seminary professors, have studied the biblical texts related to same gender sexual activity and have concluded that what the Bible does not say is as important as what it does say. What does that remind you of? Biblically. What's that? I, heard, I think I heard someone say Sodom. Yeah, interesting. Well, it actually goes back even further than that. Go, go to Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 6. Then Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. evil. How often? Continually. Continually. And Jehovah was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Keep that in mind as we jump down into our scripture text, which Alana read for us. Verse 37. As it was in the days of whom? Noah. Noah. We just read about that, right? During the days of Noah, what was happening with the weakness of man? The every intent of their thoughts of their heart was evil continually. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So is this what Jesus focused on? What it was like? Before, Jesus, or before Noah got into the ark? Did he talk about how the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually? No, look at the next verse, verse 38. 
For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. You see, the problem in Noah's days was there was forecast for rain. But people weren't interested in the forecast. There were more important things on their plans, right? They were more interested in their own plans. The antediluvians wanted to do what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it. And Jesus describes this as eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. These are all things, by the way, that are perfectly good things to do. Okay? The mistake was doing what they wanted to do as they liked without reference to the will of God. Whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. But that's not how they did it. They just ate, drank, and married each other, and that was it. You see, Noah was more than just a weatherman. He was a prophet of God, and he was preaching about the impending catastrophic global flood. A, a flood? Rain? Well, what are these things, Noah? Science has told us that has never happened before, and it is physically impossible. Why did the people not believe God? Oh, yeah, I know why. It's because the flood took place about 1,600 years after the creation, and too much time had gone by. Isn't that right? Well, no, wait a minute. Remember, God spoke with Adam and Eve face to face. And Adam lived to be about 930 years old which means that Adam was still alive when Noah's father was born, Lamech. And Adam died 126 years before Noah was born. So the cross-generational impact of Adam's personal first-hand testimony of what God did in the Garden of Eden and what happened when he fell and the forgiveness of sin, that was fresh gospel even all the way up to one generation before the flood happened. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone was holy and fine until Adam died, but within one generation, it accelerated, obviously. It accelerated so much that even though everyone in Noah's days probably heard Adam's testimony firsthand, yet how many people actually walked onto that ark? Only eight, <laughs> and they were all related to Noah. It shows you how important it is to work for our families. Well, how did this happen? I submit to you that the antediluvians, those are people who lived before the flood, they were distracted 4,500 years before cell phones were invented. So imagine what they would be like Today, uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we don't have to imagine because you and I, we do know, right? We know that the devil has invented numerous ways to distract us from spending time in the presence of God, to distract us from reading, praying, and meditating on God's word, to distract us from service, ministry, and outreach. We are so distracted, we are so overworked, we are so tired, and we are so busy. Man, I'm tired. I don't even know if I want to go to church today. I think I'll just stay home in my PJs and maybe I'll watch the live stream. Or maybe something else even. After all, it was a busy week, right? A prayer meeting? <laughs> what in the world is that? Does our church even have one? Who goes to that anymore? How much time do we spend on our phones? You know, most phones now come with counters, and they tell you how long you've been on what particular app. Go look at it. You'll be shocked. You scroll through social media, watching this short, laughing, looking at that short and going, huh, and whatever, and then boom, two hours are gone, right? And for many of us, that's happening late at night after, oh, what a hard day of work. I need to just chill. And we do this, and then occasionally the phone just falls on our head. Remember? 
Yeah? Oh, you guys are laughing because you guys are doing this. I know that. Yeah, I've done it too. I admit it. Now, compare that with how much time we spend on reading our Bible. Compare that with how much time we spend on our knees praying. Seriously. These are heart-wrenching questions, aren't they? During the days of Noah, people were doing exactly what people normally do. They just didn't focus on God. They were distracted. What will you be doing when Jesus comes? I submit that you will be doing exactly what you do every day. You will do exactly what you do on a daily basis. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, when? Now is the accepted time. Behold, when? Now is the day of salvation. I've told this story before, but it bears repeating. It comes from Pablo Goya. He talks about Aram Hassan, uh, a gentleman in Turkey in the little market there who sold ice cream. Now granted, that ice cream, it wasn't healthy, but it was chocolate, vanilla, and pistachio. And his tagline was, today you pay, tomorrow is free. So Pablo went and paid and got the ice cream as he was a boy. And so he's like, I want to get my free ice cream tomorrow. And he went back and he said, uh, sir, I paid for one yesterday. Give me one free one today. Son, today is today. Tomorrow is tomorrow. You came yesterday and now you came today. Today you pay. <laughs> no, today is tomorrow. Huh, what's wrong with you, boy? Today is today, tomorrow is tomorrow. Today you pay, tomorrow is free. So Pavel had to buy another ice cream and ate it and went back the next day. He went determined to get his free ice cream. I'm here today to get my free ice cream. You just said you came today. Today you pay, tomorrow is free. But I came tomorrow. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot come tomorrow. You only can come today. Well, when is tomorrow? Oh, boy, tomorrow never comes. This is to illustrate how we push things off and how tomorrow really doesn't come. We're so distracted today that we're like, oh, I'll deal with that tomorrow. And you know what? We do that with our spiritual life. I'm so busy right now. I'm doing a wonderful thing for you, God. Look, I'm painting the, uh, the church. Uh, I'm, I'm fixing the roof. Uh, I'm handing out door-to-door -door things. I'm, I'm doing all of these things for you. And remember in Matthew 7, what did Jesus say? I never knew you. I mean, back then, those were guys that were casting out demons and preaching sermons and doing miraculous things. And he says, I never knew you. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear my voice, do not harden your heart. When? Today. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow never comes. It's today. Well, what's the cause of hardened hearts? When I attended Portland Adventist Academy back in the mid to late 1980s, my Bible teacher, Floyd Matula, he made us, much to our consternation, I will admit at the time, he made us memorize passages from the writings of Ellen White. And one of the many that still sticks with me is found in the September 19, 1893 issue of the Review and Herald. And it says, Satan has many devices whereby he holds us back from rendering, what kind? prompt 
and unquestioning obedience to God. Who is all these distractions coming from? That's right. We have often had strong promptings and convictions of duty, but ah, we've shrunk back from fulfilling them. They have debated in their minds, shall I obey the voice of God that it bids me shake off the lethargy of the world and escape from the world as did Lot from Sodom? Or shall I listen to the voice of the world that cries peace and safety to my soul? Shall I wait for a more convenient season? And then this is the one that impacted me. All the sophistry of Satan is bound up in that one word. Wait. Wait. All the sophistry. You know what sophistry means, right? It's all the tricks and conning and all the devious plans that he has. All of it is bound up in that one word. Wait. Oh, you want to be a great Christian? Oh, yay. Just not right now. You want to pray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wait another five minutes. You want to answer that call from nominating committee? Oh, just do it next year. You want to go door to door? Oh, wonderful. Just maybe next week. That's how he works. That's how he works. All the sophistry of Satan is bound up in that one word, wait. And she laments, oh, that those who are now moved by the Spirit of God would make a decided stand for God and for the truth. Going back to the days of Noah, the men of that generation were not all in the fullest accept acceptation of the term idolaters. In other words, they weren't all idolaters. They were just normal people. Many profess to be worshipers of God. Their minds had become so blinded by constant rejection of light that they really believed Noah's mes message to be a delusion. They were well-meaning, named, professed worshipers of God. They weren't idolaters. And yet when they heard Noah preach, they were going... That's not what science says. I think he's lying to me. This was their attitude to, to Noah. A few paragraphs down, they manifested their contempt for the warnings of God by doing just as they had done before the warning was given. In other words, they were going about their daily business. They continued to plant and build, but the period of their probation was about to expire. Folks, they were distracted by eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And this is what God saw in Genesis and said that their minds were intent of their heart was evil continually. Why? Because they were doing regular things in their lives without the presence of God in their lives. Now, the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. Animals obeyed the command of God. Remarkable, right? Animals obeyed the command of God coming into the ark while men were disobedient. Men had become so hardened by their persistent rejection of light that even this scene produced but a momentary impression. So these nominal Christians saw the miracle of the animals going into the ark, and they were like, wow, maybe I should do that. And then they were like, eh, he'll be here tomorrow. He's been preaching for 100 years at least now. What is the cause of hardened hearts? Habit. Habit. 
Aristotle supposedly said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Dr. Blasloto at the University of Chicago in 1996 did a study on visualization. He gave basketballs to a group of randomly selected students and asked them to shoot free throws. The percentage of made free throws were tallied and then the students were divided into three groups and asked to perform three separate tasks over the next 30 days. The first group was told, don't ever touch a basketball for the next 30 days. No practicing, no playing, nothing to do with basketball. They had it off easy, right? The second group was told to practice shooting free throws for 30 minutes a day for 30 days. The third group was told to come to the gym every day for 30 days, spend 30 minutes with their eyes closed and simply thinking about hitting every single free throw. So they didn't touch a basketball. You got those three groups, right? One who never touched the basketball, didn't even come to the gym. One who came and practiced every day. And another group that came, didn't practice, but thought about it with their eyes closed. After the 30 days, all three groups were asked to come back and take the same number of free throws that they had at the beginning of the study. The first group of students who didn't practice at all, what do you think happened to them? They showed absolutely no improvement, okay? The second group that came and practiced every day with a physical basketball, they showed a 24% improvement. What, watch this though, get this. The third group who came closed their eyes and pretended to shoot a winning free throw each time. They never touched a basketball, they showed Guess how much of a percent increase? Do you think they showed an increase? 56%. No, not 56. That would be way too much. Because then no one would practice in real life, right? 23%. 1% difference from the people who actually touched it and who didn't touch it. They just thought about it. You do what you practice. You will do what you spend most of your time contemplating. So the best thing for us spiritually is that we need to do the works of God and we need to think about the words of God and meditate it on a regular basis. Amen. Steps to Christ. Every act of transgression. Every neglect or rejection of the grace of Christ. All of these things, each time you sin, each time you say, no, I don't wanna take part of your grace, I'm gonna wait till tomorrow. Every single time you do that is reacting upon yourself. It is hardening the heart, depraving the will, benumbing the understanding, and not only making you less inclined to yield, but less capable of yielding to the tender pleading of God's Holy Spirit. Folks, we are on dangerous grounds every single time we get distracted and tell God, oh, wait, hang on, let me do this later. Christ's object, like, object lessons. Thus, actions repeated form habits. Habits form character. And by the character, our destiny for time and for eternity is decided. Church family, remember, all of the sophistry of Satan is bound up in that one word, wait. Let's not be distracted. We need to be moved by the Spirit of God now. We need to make a decided stand for God now. We need to make a decided stand for truth now, let us no longer be distracted. Let us no longer wait. Let us no longer de delay. How many of you feel the urging of the Holy Spirit on your heart this morning? How many of you want to make a decided stand for God and for the truth? How many of you want to surrender your life, your all, 
to God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, to God who said, whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out, to God who said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Is this your desire? I ask you to stand, if you're able, where you are. And behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Father God, we are living in the apocalyptic times. It is the unveiling of the character of Christ to the world, which John wrote about, the end of times. And yet we, like the antediluvians, have become distracted, eating and drinking and just doing normal life things without having you in our lives. Forgive us, Father. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness and help us to recognize that every act of transgression, every neglect or rejection of the grace of Christ is affecting me. It is hardening my heart. It is depraving my will. It is benumbing my understanding. And it ultimately makes me less inclined to yield to you, but also less capable of yielding. So change us, Father. Give us that flesh heart instead of the stony heart. Mold us now into the image of Jesus Christ. Make us pure. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.